three, two, one. Okay. Many thanks for your, uh, many thanks for the kind invitation to chat uh, to you today at this open day, and um, we thought that it would be useful to chat. Uh, through uh, some of the common conditions that might affect children this winter um, and hopefully give uh, the families that are that are watching uh, tips and hopefully some useful tools to be able to uh, look after their children if they're unwell. Uh, I'm Dr Mark Ty, I'm a consultant paediatrician at Poole Hospital uh, and I've also got my son Ed with me who's had some breathing difficulties in the past and he'll be asking some questions uh, at the end of the talk though we're hoping that there'll be some questions on the chat bar uh, that we that we can go through as well uh, next slide please james thank you um so it's useful to touch on why children are different um they're not just small adults they can they can look quite unwell quite quickly and be very alarming for parents it's useful to know that their lungs and airways are smaller and they can also get more tired quickly. Their muscles uh, run out of energy quicker uh, and so they can get quite breathless more easily. They haven't quite met as many infections as adults. Their immunity is slightly lower. And as we all know, when they're unwell and distressed, giving them treatment can be incredibly tricky and it can feel for parents like they're changing moment to moment. Next slide, please. Um, so here are some useful tips that I hope it's that I hope it's uh, helps in looking at your children. You don't need to be a trained medical or nursing professional uh, in order to try and just step back a little bit from from those feelings of worry and try and work out how unwell your child is. It is useful to look at them when they're settled. So if you can have something that distracts them, uh, perhaps give them a dose of paracetamol and just give it five or ten minutes just for uh, to allow uh, everything just to settle down and try and assess them if you can with a normal temperature and just look at how are they. Are they alert? miserable and upset or are they floppy and difficult to rouse which would be more of a concern the other thing is is can they take in fluid um, if they can't take in fluid is it because their swallow is quite painful um, in which case um, pain relief like ibuprofen or paracetamol would be useful or is it because they're too short of breath to feed which would be more of a concern and we'd look for children to ha be having um, at least a half of what they'd normally have in order to keep them safe and you can assess whether a child is well hydrated by checking out, seeing if their urine output in terms of wet nappies um, is reasonable. Also, if you look in their mouth, is it nice and moist and you can see some fluid there? And uh, you'll forgive me, apologies, this is the first technical term of the talk, something called capillary refill, where if you press on their finger for five seconds and then release it, does the pink bit refill uh, within two seconds? And that's 1,000, 2,000, not one, two, because as parents, we all get worried when our children are unwell. And then in terms of looking at their breathing, if they're short of breath, um, what's their effort of breathing? How many how many breaths are they having in one minute? And when you look at the picture, the baby picture there, there are some clues if a baby's working really hard. So uh, is their nose flaring every time they breathe in? Um, are they are their ribs sucking in uh, just just underneath or at the side? Um, do they have seesaw breathing? So if their chest is breathing in, is their abdomen uh, and the chest opens up, is their abdomen coming in? And that's a sign of a child who's working really hard. Uh, and then you're looking at the effect of the breathing. Do, despite the child breathing fast, are their lips and tongue dusky, which is more of a concern? Are their hands and feet cold? Again, that would be a concern. Or their skin colour mottled? If their hands and feet are more warm, that's more reassuring in terms of hydration. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and if you're not sure about the pattern of breathing, if you were to take a picture on your on your mobile phone or smartphone, uh, and that can be really useful if you're trying to chat to a doctor who's triaging, um, or or if you're going into or if you're going into the surgery, that a video clip of their breathing pattern, particularly if they have pauses and you're just trying to catch that moment, can also help. Next slide. So this is what we're seeing a lot of this winter. So these are upper respiratory tract infections or commonly known as coughs and colds. So they're very common. They are 
also common as we're coming out of COVID and children are meeting other children and catching more infections, they are very unlikely to be bacterial, much more likely to be viral. So they have a runny nose, a mildly sore throat. Uh, they may Their food intake may be down, but they may be able to drink a bit. Their temperature may go up and down. But antibiotics don't generally help and sometimes cause a rash and diarrhea and they are very common and they don't necessarily need a, a, a hospital or GP attendance. Most children will catch infections and, you know, in under ones, it can be as much as eight infections in a winter. Um, in older children, uh, slightly less than that, but you can expect, you know, uh, probably an infection uh, at least, a, at least one every month, if not one every two weeks. And the cough after a cold can last for up to six weeks, so not to be surprised by that. Next slide, please. Um, this is the first condition that we're going to chat about that can be a bit more of a concern. So this is asthma. So this is uh, where your airways tighten when you're uh, when you're breathing fast. Next slide, please. Um, so um, in terms of asthma, it's wheeze or cough when your child is otherwise well. It may be worse with coughs and colds, but these are children who cough when they run about, cough in a cold environment, like a, if they go into a cold room uh, and then and they're coughing at night. Certainly the triggers are worse. Uh, sorry, the, the triggers can make things worse. So think about, you know, if there's a new pet, if there's significant uh, dust from uh, building work or um, if, if if a child's room hasn't been, uh, you know, is, has got a bit dusty. Um, also think about smoke in terms of tobacco smoke or vaping um, and also think about whether there's damp as well um, in the environment. The other thing that can help us understand is does it get better with salbutamol? Um, other things that can mimic asthma, uh, viral induced wheeze in younger children. So these are children who are well generally, but with viruses, their airways just tighten up. They may also benefit from salbutamol. The other thing is something called pass, pa, uh, persistent bacterial bronchitis. So they get a chronic, very wet cough uh, that's after a virus and it lasts for more than six to eight weeks. Um, and sometimes that's uh, uh, that's an infection that may need some antibiotics. And we've got more detail about that later. There's also foreign body or also functional breathing problems where when the child's asleep at night, there are no symptoms. Next slide, please. So what's happening in asthma? So instead of a normal aero, airway, which is your picture on the left, the airway becomes uh, inflamed uh, and has increased mucus production. And then if there's an attack, the airway gets much tighter um, and uh, also the amount of mucus that's produced is much greater. So the effective airway uh, goes from quite wide to really very tight and the child struggles to breathe. OK, next slide. Um, what can we do for it? So um, salbutamol is very effective, so that helps relax the airways. Um, we generally give it with a spacer in children because that helps instead of the salbutamol drug just depositing at the back of the mouth, it helps it get right into the lungs. Um, and we'd encourage children if they're really struggling to have 10 puffs four hourly at home. And if they're managing with that, they don't necessarily need an assessment. But if they are needing more than 10 puffs every four hours, so say a child only need, get, gets to two hours before uh, needing their inhaler again, then we'd suggest coming to hospital. Um, the other thing is steroids, uh, the, the two Pac-Man down at the bottom, we can use either uh, dexamethasone or prednisolone to try to improve uh, and that helps by reducing the amount of mucus in the airways. Uh, if a child needs to come to hospital, we may still go with the inhaler if they're tolerating it well. Some children may need a nebulizer. It'll still be the same drug, but it can be delivered with oxygen as well. And then there's another uh, medication called Montelukast that again reduces airway inflammation. OK, next slide. But what can we do at home to try to reduce uh, reduce the chances of our children becoming unwell this winter. So if children have asthma, it's about giving their treatment regularly. It can be really easy with busy lives just to miss the miss their inhalers. And studies show that most families are giving their children their inhalers about two thirds of the time. But if we can get that 
uh, increased, uh, for example, their steroid inhaler increased uh, as we go into winter, it may mean that they can fight their uh, virus off better and not need to come to hospital. But do check that you're, you've got an inhaler and that it's in date. And the inhaler should go with the child. So if they're going to school or to activities or to another household, that the inhaler goes with them. Um, think about managing weight and encouraging exercise as children who haven't done um, a lot of exercise and gained quite a bit of weight. Their asthma can be a bit more severe to manage. Think about reducing the triggers. Um, so, you know, we do know, for example, that um, in parents who smoke, even if they smoke outside, uh, they're often carrying the smoke on their clothes and children have detectable levels of nicotine in their own urine. So we know the children are getting the smoke in, inhaled. And if, if there's any way of reducing the uh, amount of cigarettes that's being smoked, or if people smoke outside, that they come in, they wash their face, wash their hands and change their top, we know that halves the amount of nicotine in children's bloodstreams. Definitely seek help if the breathing difficulties aren't getting better, but think of the impact on school um, and also book in with the asthma nurse at the GP for your yearly review, just to make sure your medications are up to date. Next slide. Um, so bronchiolitis. So this is the other frequent infection, the uh, frequent issue that we are seeing at the moment. So these are generally children under one year of age and Although babies normally breathe faster, um, this is an infection that's given them a snotty illness, but then they are struggling with their breathing on top of this um, and they're working harder to breathe. Whilst newborns can have very short pauses in their breathing, generally less than 15 seconds, uh, this isn't generally associated with increased work breathing. And if children are having, uh, babies are having frequent pauses and they're longer, definitely seek help uh, at the time. And if they're too breathless to feed as well, please seek help. There's a virus called RSV that generally causes this um, and their narrow airways are more inflamed. Um, and we, and babies who have been born early, babies who are under six weeks or who have other health conditions such as heart issues are much more likely to have quite a severe course with their bronchiolitis and need more help. But generally, these babies often need hot oxygen in hospital, may need help with their fluids, such as with a nasogastric tube or with uh, a drip in, in their hand, uh, and then they recover it. But it would be fair to say a significant bronchiolitis when you're younger can predispose you to asthma later. Next slide. The other um, respiratory infection that's useful to know about that we're seeing a lot of at the moment is croup. It's mainly caused by a virus called parainfluenza, and these children have a distinctive seal-like cough. Um, arr, 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 maybe the cough that um, parents will hear. It's also associated with breathing difficulties, and the child has a, <gasps> a, a an inspiratory noise um, that we medically call stridor, and they struggle to breathe, and they can be quite panicked by this, and this can be very frightening for families and the child, and it's and because it tends to happen at night, these children can wake up with sudden breathing difficulties. Take them into a cold environment. Uh, steam doesn't generally help, although um, uh, you know, although it is something historically um, has been has been advised. But the main treatments that we use is a steroid called dexamethasone. It usually works within about 15 minutes, helps to calm down the airway inflammation, and the child then tends to relax. Although a dose of prednisolone, a, a dose of paracetamol, uh, will help to bring down a temperature and bring down airway soreness and can help in the meantime whilst uh, whilst um, help is coming. Uh, in short, in hospital, we can we do have other tricks up our sleeve, um, oxygen and adrenaline if needed. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so the next issue is uh, pneumonia. So this is what many families are worried about when their child has a cough or a cold. Children with pneumonia have an increasing wet cough, very high temperatures that have continued for several days. They have rapid breathing and they can also have a grunt. So they're breathing in and out. Um, and at the end of breathing out, they have a mm, mm, noise. Um, they are often looking quite floppy. They're not very interested in the in what's going on around them, and their breathing rate is settled even when their uh, their breathing rate is high even when their temperature is settled. Um, they can present with slightly unusual 
pain so they can present with uh, chest pain on one side of the chest or even um, pain affecting the shoulder um, if the infection is irritating the diaphragm uh, they can also complain of tummy pain as well um, if they have a rash that doesn't go away when they press or they're very cold peripherally that's definitely uh, something to seek urgent help for um, and wheezing is unlikely uh, with pneumonia we do see some pneumonias that are viral, but antibiotics is definitely helpful. And when you're in hospital, we also use oxygen and physiotherapy to help. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a little picture of what happens with pneumonia. So basically part of the lung uh, fills with uh, muck. Uh, that's a technical term. Um, so uh, it's cellular debris with white cells um, and it that part of the lung doesn't then allow oxygen to get into the bloodstream, which is why children have difficulty breathing. Next slide, please. Um, the only other thing that's also worth bearing in mind when we are seeing lots of children with coughs and colds um, is, the, is the issue with foreign body. If there's a really good history of choking after having had a small toy toy in, in the mouth, we do take that quite seriously. And these are children who start choking in the daytime uh, and coughing uh, and out of the blue, rather than say an intercurrent infection where the coughing gradually gets worse over a few hours. Some children can be struggling to swallow or drool. And if we don't get the foreign body out, it can move down to the small railway. So the child may have not have so much difficulty breathing, but they may just have a chronic cough. And a chest x-ray can be useful, though it can depend on what the object is as to whether it shows up on a chest x-ray. Next slide, please. The other thing that's useful to chat about actually is functional or habitual cough. Um, so these are children who may well have had an infection that's triggered by a virus, but that has settled down, but they're left with a desire to cough and clear their chest. Uh, the cough goes away when they're fast asleep and there's no shortness of breath associated with it. It can occur in children who are between four years to their teenage years and treatments like salbutamol may have frustratingly little effect, but that's probably because there's no airway inflammation there. It can be quite loud and disruptive and obviously because of our societal awareness of cough at the moment after COVID can be quite bothersome for teachers and families. And, and some children can have a, a cycle where they sniff back and uh, kind of the, where there's lots of mucus and then cough it up. The usefulness is to explain that this is a functional and habitual cough after um, having had a thorough history and examination um, and investigations as needed. And what we try to do is to explain to children that having a little bit of mucus back there is OK, it's normal, but because they're so sensitive at the moment after an infection, they're just trying to clear that normal amount of secretion. And what we try and encourage our children to do is to huff, not to cough. So uh, <laughs> to try to clear that excess secretions. And that can be a lot less disruptive um, for everybody around. It isn't infections, infectious, so that schools which may, um, may, may send children home, home if they have a significant cough or reach for the lateral flow test. Um, often these children will have had lots of lateral flow tests which are completely negative. Next slide, please. Um, uh, next slide, if that's OK. Um, so, um, Ed, can I draw you in at this point, if that's OK? So um, if that's OK, this is this is Ed, who's my son. And we just wondered if Ed could maybe ask a couple of questions. And then what we'd probably do is have a look at the chat bar and see if there's any questions uh, coming through um, and probably address them if if they uh, as they come, um, if that's OK. So Ed, did you want to ask a question? How would you recommend parents to help their children with difficulties to their breathing? OK, well, I think it's I think it's uh, useful if parents know what the cause of the difficulty breathing is uh, to try to reach for their usual treatment first and to reach for their and to have a treatment plan because that helps manage that worry that parents often have if it's a new difficulty breathing then it is it is useful to get an assessment of it particularly if so if they're really struggling and they've got the the, the things that we talked about earlier in terms of the dusky lips and tongue um, they're struggling to feed and things like that that needs an emergency assessment but if they are 
have it, you know, they've got a chronic cough um, that may need just evaluation via chatting to either NHS 111 at the weekend or, or the GP during the week um, and trying to identify what that cause of difficulty breathing is and then you can move from there. Does exercise help children with dif difficulty breathing? Oh, that's a good question. So, um, so yes, it does. Um, I think it depends on how the child is at the time. Obviously, uh, we don't want children exercising when they're struggling with their breathing at that moment. Um, I think gradual exercise and gradually building children up to do more exercise helps their lung capacity and helps their reserve. But there may be, for example, for children with asthma, there may be things that uh, you can do before exercise, like a couple of puffs of salbutamol with their spacer that may help exercise be easier. And just to allow children access to their spacer and inhaler if they need during exercise so that they can get that airway relief if they need. Um, so Ed, I don't know if you could have a look at the chat bar and see if there are any other questions that we've got and then we could maybe ask. OK, do you mind reading from the top if that's OK? Are there children, uh, are children with asthma more at risk from COVID? Um, so we we have watched many children with different health conditions through the COVID pandemic and we've now got much more idea of those children who are at much higher risk and those children who are who, who are likely to be safe. So the vast majority of children with asthma are safe from COVID. There are a few children who are, are have very unstable asthma. Um, that they may be on regular oral steroids or other um, high dose treatments, so there's a medication called theophylline. Um, but, um, but generally, most children with asthma uh, tolerate COVID very well. Um, it's mainly their age. So the younger they are um, with COVID, as we know, they do do very well. It's the much older adults with significant chronic health conditions that run into trouble. But we do, um, you know, identify. So those children who have very severe asthma are often under close follow up by the hospital and already have open access to pool hospitals. So if your child hasn't got that degree of severity of asthma, we wouldn't be excessively worried by COVID. At what age do children usually grow out of a viral induced wheeze? Oh, yeah, good question. So um, most children usually grow out of viral induced wheeze um, probably between the age of five to seven. Uh, there are some children whose viral induced wheeze then becomes a bit more asthma like. So they um, have that and this is something we tell tell to parents is, you know, if they're coughing when they are in the cold environment with exercise and, um, uh, you know, uh, and as they um, and coughing at night, that that's more asthma, if you see what I mean. But most children grow out of their asthma um, in um, as they go in, as they go into school. Uh, sorry, grow out of their viral induced wheeze as they go to school. Is there a specific type of exercise that children should do to help with asthma? Um, I think it's more about so aerobic exercise certainly helps, um, you know, so but it, it depends on what the child. It's much more fun to do what the child likes to do and what they want to do with their mates. I'd much rather we'd much rather children enjoy themselves exercising and get that positive benefit from it rather than do something that's essentially prescribed but that they hate. So, you know, things like, you know, swimming or running or cycling or um, and it's important for parents to remember the limitations of their children not, and not expect them to do loads of exercise, but to start small and to build up and to keep it fun. Um, yeah. Otherwise, no, you know, and also to do exercise with their friends and their peers um, is is the most fun way of doing it. Would you recommend children with asthma and allergies to get the flu jab? 
uh, definitely, yes. So um, the flu jab is uh, recommended for all children who are in on inhaled steroids uh, every year, and it, it definitely helps reduce the severity of their infection uh, uh, on their airways and reduces the likelihood that they need to come to hospital. It doesn't pre prevent against all viruses, but you know, uh, influenza is uh, a virus that can run children into significant difficulties with asthma. For teenagers, how does vaping affect breathing difficulties? Oh, that's a, that is it's such a current question. So um, essentially vaping, uh, we know, is not entirely harmless to children's airways. So the type of particles that children inhale, uh, that children inhale um, actually can irritate their lungs. The vaping market is relatively unregulated and we do have, we do have multiple cases of um, pneumonitis, inflammation of the lungs related to certain preparations of vaping. We know that uh, if, if if people are trying to get off smoking, smoking is the worst end of it, um, but the, if children vape, often that vaping can turn into conversion to smoking later. So we would really advise them to avoid vaping if they've never vaped before. Brilliant. Well, that's the, the last question that's come in. So I just wanted to say, um, and before handing back to you, just a, a massive, massive thank you for your talk um, to both Mark and to Eddie. Great to have you with us, Eddie, um, um, but really enjoyed it. So hoping now you can um, close up with any final comments and thank you both again very much for your time on a Saturday morning. That is an absolute pleasure, James. It's really kind of you to invite us, invite us here. Um, you know, breathing difficulties is something that is difficult to manage as a parent I know that and you know even medical training can make it harder so I understand how how difficult it is for families but we hope this resource is useful to help parents who are trying to look at their children and go where do I go with this breathing with with my child with breathing difficulties thank you thank you so much